Hello, everyone. It says that I'm Nathan, but I am not. <laughs> um, we may as well get started. Are we good? Good. We may as well get started here. I just know it's a few minutes after one o'clock. I just want to say welcome to everybody here in the room and on online to the May History Research Rounds. I want to start today by acknowledging and recognizing those of us attending in the Kingston area are situated in the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. I also want to acknowledge our guest today is coming from the University of Manitoba, whose campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Diné peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. As we're winding down our history rounds and the campuses are quiet and we sink into the summer term, I wanna express my gratitude for these lands, for the warm weather we're enjoying, the chance to be outdoors and the opportunity to work together as people interested in improving the health system with a specific interest in, in ensuring healthcare is accessible to everyone. I wanna thank each of you, and for those of you who are just joining now, for taking the time over the next hour to be present as we consider how our research at HISPRI can help support principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. We have a special extra guest out of town, Dr. Dr. Nathan Nickel today to talk about routinely connect, collected data for health and social services research. And as we listen to Dr. Nickel, we consider how to use data positively to inform health policies and decisions that support a better and more equitable system. And to acknowledge that data may miss voices and people, and we must work to include these going forward. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nathan Nickel, an Associate Professor of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. As the Director of the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, Dr. Nickel leads a research center of excellence at the University of Manitoba with 60 research staff and scientists that creates evidence in population health, data science, and social services research. The center also maintains and curates, this is impressive, the Manitoba Population Research Data Repository, which is an impressive collection of administrative data documenting Manitobans' experiences with health and social services. Often don't get the social service side. And so I just wanna thank you so much today for coming and, and sharing your work, we're, we're super keen to hear. Thanks so much. Um, so we're, uh, oh, goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're doing things a little bit less formally. Um, we're sitting around a table. Uh, and I hope that folks uh, joining us online are also having an enjoyable afternoon. Um, I have a few slides that I'm going to share uh, just outlining uh, the work that's happening at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy around routinely collected information. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some initiatives focused on uh, multi-regional research and overcoming some of the challenges there. I just want to direct your attention to a paper that some of my colleagues and I published in the International Journal of Population Data Science, which outlines the framework that we use at MCHP uh, for doing administrative data work. Uh, so just recognizing not everyone here or either online or in person might be familiar with us as a center. Uh, we're a research center based out of the Health Sciences Campus at the University of Manitoba. We have 65 researchers, staff um, that work with us. And we also have roughly 75 trainees that we're working with who use the administrative data that we maintain, manage, and curate. Um, when I think about the core work that we do as a research center, it really comes down to four um, spaces. Uh, we receive funding from the Manitoba government to maintain, manage, curate uh, the Manitoba Population Research Data Repository, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the researchers that are based out of MCHP, there are um, up seven of us currently. Uh, we bring in funding and we do research. Um, and then we provide uh, our third area, we provide research and analytic services to the government um, of Manitoba, but also to the broader research community of folks that want to access our in, um, the information we maintain. And then fourth, we um, have a mandate for training, building capacity amongst graduate students and also government staff on how to use um, data for, for research and analytics. 
In your introduction, you mentioned some of our social data, and I, I feel like that's a real strength as a research center. We have um, a very comprehensive uh, set of databases that record routine contacts with the social services that we have in our province. So everything from living in publicly funded housing, um, receiving income assistance, there's a whole suite of family services um, that the government provides that we get copies of those data. Um, and as well, another rel um, strength for us as a center is our collection of education data and um, data with the legal system. Um, so education data going back, um, I joke with my students when I teach um, that if you graduated from high school after 1995 in Manitoba, we have copies of your 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 information. Mm -hmm. So everything from 1995 uh, moving forward, um, copies of of records uh, within um, uh, secondary and elementary school. We have University of Manitoba data. Um, going back to the mid 40s. Um, so we have a lot of information there and we're bringing in information uh, from the different colleges at the in Manitoba. So really comprehensive uh, education data. Um, and all of that information can be linked at the individual and, um, levels. Um, and because of a project that Dr. Mahar is co-PI on, um, building a um, set of databases around, or a set of um, uh, infrastructure around building families um, uh, so that we can look at family contacts with the government system. So um, that's funding that Dr. Mahar and Dr. Rukwia have um, through the CFI. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about our uh, the data that we maintain, uh, there's uh, a paper in the International Journal of Epi that I wrote a long time ago. Um, another one um, that's much more recent um, by Dr. Amani Hamad, which is the top paper there. Uh, she worked with uh, Dr. Wal Wheeler and Dr. Rukwia around developing a multi-generational cohort in Manitoba. So the ability to follow grandparents to parents to kids uh, within the data to start to look at multi-generational impacts. And we're um, really excited because uh, Dr. Hamad um, is uh, will be continuing her research program using the administrative data that that we house and curate. So I mentioned that we get copies of uh, data that are generated through routine delivery of care. Um, and although those some of those data go back to the 70s or 40s in the case of the um, University of Manitoba information, um, all of that began uh, because of um, doctors um, Norlu and Les Roos. So they, they moved to Manitoba um, uh, in the 70s. And during the cre uh, when uh, they discovered and were learning about administrative health data, they saw that as a real opportunity for doing research that can um, generate new insights into the delivery of healthcare, but also that if uh, through building partnerships with folks within the healthcare system, that evidence could be used to inform decision making. And so during the 80s, they um, really cultivated a relationship with government to the point where um, government uh, became willing to uh, create or found, um, fund the creation of a research center um, that would uh, maintain, manage, and curate the data on their behalf. And then in exchange for that, we would be able to answer research questions or analytic questions uh, that the government had to inform strategic planning and decision making. And all of that started because of the vision of um, Drs. Norlu, uh, Norlu and Les Roos uh, back in the 80s and early 90s. So MCHP was formally established in 1991. And since then, uh, we've been doing grant-funded research uh, through Tri-Council funding, but also research um, that government commissions um, us to do. So early on, that research really focused on the healthcare system. Uh, so early projects in the 90s looked at things like, why is it that in Hospital A, the average patient stays uh, three days, but in Hospital B, the same type of patient stays five days. What's happening that's leading to those differences? And so folks uh, looked at discharge patterns. They de developed 
estimates for hospital costs for different um, uh, procedures, and also looking at seasonal patterns and hospital use. So very, very, very focused on the healthcare system. Starting uh, in the mid 90s to early 2000s, uh, there was a real push to bring in social data, recognizing the social determinants of health and its impact on, on health outcomes. And so with the addition of social data, we um, started getting asked to look at um, interactions with the social system and how those are um, interactions influence health outcomes. So for example, there was a study in, the, um, in 2000 that looked at the healthcare needs of children um, uh, living in, in households that are receiving income assistance. Uh, we have uh, what used to be called the Babies First program, um, uh, which is a program for uh, families in Manitoba, and, there, and Dr. Brownell did an evaluation on that. And we also looked at um, folks that are living in public funded housing and some of their health outcomes. After looking at that intersection of health and social services, uh, we began to receive requests from government to look really just at um, non-health outcomes. So we looked at things like education outcomes of kids who are um, involved with child protection services. Um, there was a PACS um, education program delivered to schools in the province that uh, we were asked to evaluate. And most recently, uh, we did a study, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a couple of moments, looking at the overlap of kids who become involved with the child protection services and the criminal justice system. So it, our research really started out within the healthcare system, but as we were able to bring in social data, um, thinking about how social determinants intersect and in influence health outcomes, and then also finally looking at those broader social um, programs and their impacts on on health and well being. Uh, so I want to just I want to touch on a couple of the highlights of um, some specific projects. Uh, Next, but before I do, it's really um, important to emphasize that the work that we do at MCHP really is based out of a cultivated relationship with system decision makers. So since 1991, MCHP has been um, hosting knowledge exchange events. We've been involving uh, government and uh, health system decision makers in our research process. And with the intent that our research, um, whether it's grant funded or um, government commissioned, can really generate evidence that can be used in um, informing where the systems are going next. And so uh, one example of that, uh, we were asked uh, as a center to look at chronic kidney disease in Manitoba uh, by the government. This project was led by um, Dr. Mariette Chartier. Uh, and what she did was looked at a, a preliminary epidemiology of chronic kidney disease um, in, the, in Manitoba, and then used that information to look at future projections. So she did some projection modeling to identify what are the trends likely to be over the next 10 years? How might those trends differ by um, region within our province? And those results ended up informing provincial planning for chronic kidney disease services and specifically some early intervention and screening programs for northern Manitoba. I mentioned just a couple of moments ago a project led by Dr. Marnie Brownell. Um, we were, uh, as a center, asked to look at the overlap of kids who are involved with child and protection services and the legal system. So First, they are taken into care um, by child and family services, or they're receiving, um, they have an open file with child protection. And what are their trajectories through the legal system? Do they have an increased risk for, for involvement with the legal system? And what are some of their health outcomes? One of the things that uh, Marnie found was the really high prevalence of mental health um, um, diagnoses amongst kids who are uh, both involved with child protection services and go on to uh, be involved with the legal system. And because of the work that Marnie led, uh, that has resulted in the development of um, some mental health programming targeted for children involved with um, uh, both systems. So that, that close connection over time um, really uh, informing decisions. 
There was another project uh, that was completed in 2018 that looked at alcohol use disorders in their province. Um, and so what uh, the project looked at was um, uh, basic epidemiology of time trends of um, alcohol use disorders, and then taking a slight deeper dive into health services associated with um, being diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder. One of the uh, team members of, of that project was a trainee um, within psychiatry, and he had a real interest in understanding whether folks with an alcohol use disorder were receiving um, pharmaceutical uh, treatment for their um, for their um, substance use. So there's some prescription drugs on the on the market that um, can be used to treat alcohol use disorders. And what he found what um, as part of this project was that, of everyone who is eligible for receiving that prescription, only 3% actually did. Um, and so that and uh, um, doing some uh, qualitative work, finding out around some of the cost barriers of accessing that prescription drug. And so the results of that analysis ended up informing changes to the Pharmacare plan, where now um, uh, those prescription drugs are included in the formulary for low-income uh, Manitobans. So, so quite an exciting outcome there. Uh, so a lot of our, our work is done out of um, using funding with uh, that we receive from the government. Um, this project resulted in some peer-reviewed papers that um, came, uh, were published in CMAJ Open and Addiction um, and uh, the journal Alcohol. Uh, some of the work that uh, Dr. Chartier did around CKD, chronic kidney disease, has also been published in, in peer-reviewed journals. So really leveraging the work that we do with government um, to advance some of our peer-reviewed uh, uh, research. We also often turn that work into future grants. So um, the project I mentioned that was led by Dr. Brownell, uh, where she looked at the overlap of kids in care and involvement with the legal system. Um, that has come into a project she's now leading um, uh, called Spectrum. So by way of introduction uh, to Dr. Brownell, she's currently our Associate Director of Research and a Senior Scientist at NCHP. And because of um, all of the work that we, we've done around the social determinants and how important it is to be thinking about social policy when we're considering health and well-being, uh, Marnie um, secured funding from the um, SHRC uh, to establish a partnership called Spectrum, which is really aimed at looking outside the healthcare system to build, uh, to do social policy research in partnership with uh, government, academia, and a new partner that we've been cultivating over time at MCHP, um, uh, community groups. So she's uh, brought together a really expansive team of researchers uh, across uh, Manitoba, so not just based out of U of M, but also um, Brandon, um, community agencies providing community um, services to folks and government departments to figure out how can we work together in order to co-create evidence that can meaningfully shape um, social policy to improve health and well-being. Right now, um, we've been having a series of workshops, uh, both in person and then COVID um, virtual, where we've identified what are some of the key policy issues that are facing Manitoba and how can administrative data be used to inform improvements on those policies? And out of that, out of that work has come a deeper dive into looking at the impacts of, of taking a child into care. So um, expanding on some of the work that she did in that, that first project, um, she has designed a study um, using fancy math and instrumental variables, et cetera, to um, think about what's the what would have happened if a kid was not taken into care? Like where their out where their outcomes have been different and narrowing in her focus on like there's some kids where there's a gray area. There's some discretion on whether or not they're take, being taken into care. What what's the outcomes for those kids if they if they are taken into care versus the counterfactual if they hadn't been? And looking at things like education, um, attainment, uh, different health outcomes. 
And we'll be presenting uh, yeah. preliminary results from that in a couple of weeks at our next workshop, which is is really exciting. So um, we can share that once we've done a little bit more sensitivity analyses. I get to be part of that work, which is super exciting. Um, most of what you've heard me talk about is around kids. Um, Dr. Malcolm Dope um, looks at the other end of the spectrum, um, thinking about uh, transitions of, of elders uh, within the healthcare system. And he's also looked at things like supportive housing and personal care home. So some of his work um, has projected the future need for um, nursing home beds in our province and really focus on identifying what are some alternative care options that the province can uh, put forward in order to alleviate some of the pressures experienced by the, by the healthcare system. Uh, what's exciting about the work that he's been doing here is he's developed some amazing partnerships with folks in Norway, and now they're involved in like a natural experiment comparing policies in Norway with policies in Manitoba using administrative data to figure out what are some of the best practices that we can um, put forward to take care of our our elder our aging population. We have um, uh, our former director, Dr. Alan Katz, um, who's a primary care doc who's had a lot of interest in um, understanding primary care and um, how to improve um, services provided to uh, um, historically marginalized populations. When COVID came around, uh, he what became particularly interested in, are there ways that we can use administrative data to identify folks living with long COVID? And um, how can that identification then be used to inform um, healthcare delivery um, to them? So he's currently um, leading a CHR grant uh, to develop a case definition for long COVID within administrative data and monitoring those that he's identified for um, looking at long-term health outcomes. And some of his early work has already been used to um, do strategic planning amongst uh, the First Nations Health and Social Secretary of Manitoba, um, and as well the healthcare system uh, to really mitigate uh, some of the negative outcomes experienced by marginalized populations. And the, the last um, example I'm just gonna touch on uh, before transitioning is some work led, being led by Dr. Marcelo Urquia. Uh, he's really focused on um, immigrants' health and uh, one of his first projects coming into MCHP was to bring in immigrant data and look at health outcomes amongst newcomers in, in, in Manitoba. Uh, what he's done with that is he's really branched out um, and uh, established a, a leadership presence uh, within um, the immigrant research community, looking at um, uh, migration around the globe and identifying health outcomes there. He's also been working with uh, folks who specialize in data quality like Dr. Lisa Lix around what can be used to improve, what can we do to improve the data quality for immigrant data um, that are coming into the repository. So all of those projects are really focused in just on Manitoba. And I, those of you on the call and those in the room are aware that administrative data um, are, bound by legislation that prevent them from leaving the province. And so one of the big challenges that we face as a field is how do you start to construct a pan-Canadian picture using administrative data? Um, because of um, jurisdictional um, legislation, right now our data are fairly fragmented um, in the sense that I, I'm not I'm not able to pull information, say, from Ontario and Manitoba into one single database. Um, on top of that, data storage um, and data curation techniques differ across uh, provinces and territories. And so there are a lot of real challenges in making uh, or leveraging the natural experiments we have within Canada of differing policies uh, by provinces um, uh, and, and using that natural experiment to identify what works and what doesn't work to improve the health and well-being of Canadians. So to overcome that, um, the Health Data Research Network of Canada has really been focused in on what can we do 
as a network of data centers um, to support and facilitate uh, multi-regional research or research using uh, routinely collected health, um, information uh, from across Canada. HCRN Canada has a variety of different uh, member organizations, uh, inclusive of um, SPORE units and the data centers that manage and curate uh, their respective provincial data. Um, and um, some jurisdictions that don't currently have data centers, but are, are establishing them. Um, and what our mission and, and uh, vision is, is that data from across Canada can really be used to drive improvements in health and health equity. Um, we don't have to limit ourselves to single jurisdiction research. We can have multi-regional research. We just need the proper infrastructure to support that. And so we're working hard to bring together folks from uh, organizations across Canada in order to move this forward. So some of our underlying values and principles, um, we really um, are founded based on uh, a sense of collaboration, working together um, to improve equity, uh, not only for the um, uh, people groups within Canada, but also equity across our, our member organizations. Uh, we've been uh, working to establish trust, uh, not just, again, amongst academia, but we have a whole initiative focused on developing and maintaining trust amongst the public, which um, I will get to. Um, uh, um, creativity, uh, excellence, um, and uh, the way that we work together. Um, so Dr. Yeah, you can see that. Dr. Kim McGrail uh, from Pop Data BC is the scientific director and CEO of the network. We have um, a, a team of central administration uh, based out of UBC that really manages and coordinates the network together. Uh, an executive committee made up of um, directors of different centers um, and as well some folks with topic area um, focus. So one of our executive team members, um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Walker, is um, leading our Indigenous Data Sovereignty Initiative. Um, and we also have uh, folks uh, from the public that are leading our public advisory council. And then Underneath, our, our, uh, we also have a work group leads team, um, which are working on advancing different initiatives of, of the network. So what are we aiming to do? Uh, we're really wanting to create a centralized process that if you're interested in doing multi-regional research, say you're, you have a research question that would benefit from administrative data based out of BC, Ontario, Manitoba, and uh, Saskatchewan. You can come to um, uh, the DASH, which is our intake portal for the Health Data Research Network, um, and uh, provide your project information. What are some of the services that you're going to need, the data that you require? And then through that DASH web portal, that request will go out to the um, data centers from whom you require data. So rather than relying on, like, if you're like me and you don't have a broad network of, of connections across Canada, this can help you establish that network of connections and can be really beneficial, especially for early career researchers. Um, so you put your portal in and it it puts, you put your request into the portal, it distributes it to all the um, uh, centers that would be involved. And then they provide you with a cost quote, et cetera, um, that you then provide to CHR when you're going to get your funding. Once you do get your funding, then um, HCRN helps to coordinate uh, the work to support you in developing a data analysis plan to make sure that um, the work that you're doing um, uh, is following practices, similar practices across Canada. And then uh, your project is up and running. Um, so really aiming to break down some of the barriers that researchers experience when wanting to do multi-regional research. So that's like our core outward facing um, set of activities. Internal, what's happening behind the scenes is we, um, our work groups are really focusing on how can we harmonize the diverse set of data so that 
the fact that the data might be stored differently in Ontario versus Manitoba is, is not a barrier to you moving forward with your work. So part of that involves creating a common data model. So we're currently piloting a project right now um, where we're um, testing out a couple of different common data models um, and how they might be implemented across the network. So we're um, using the CNODES common data model right now, the, um, the Canadian Network for Observation um, Drug Effectiveness Studies. We're also using OMOP, which uh, has been used extensively in, in the UK and in Europe um, as a common data model. And identifying what's working and what's not working uh, to, to ensure that we have um, similar data definitions across Canada. One of the current challenges we face with this is all of these common data models have been built around the idea of health data. And so adapting them to social data is, is currently um, uh, one of the areas that we're spending quite a bit of time uh, focused in on. Something else that we're focused in on is uh, improving um, uh, the uh, application of equity lenses to the data. So recognizing that the data that are generated through the routine delivery of health and social services across Canada are steeped in systems that um, oppress uh, racialized and marginalized group or completely erase some populations. Uh, and what can be done to um, ensure that we start to do better with um, the use of these data. So that work is being led uh, by Dr. Amy Fryer and actually one of uh, Dr. Mahar's uh, PhD trainees, uh, uh, Morgan Sterling is a, a PhD fellow um, who's, who's really leading that work uh, from a gender equity lens. We also have a, a work group uh, being led by Dr. Jennifer Walker uh, that's focused on uh, developing um, approaches to ensuring that Indigenous data sovereignty is recognized in the use of data across Canada. So that there's very well-established policies and, and approaches in place for when an Indigenous identifier like the First Nations um, status identifier or Métis citizenship uh, identifier is being used. What is less well established is when those identifiers aren't necessarily going to be used, but the data um, have overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in them. So working with uh, communities um, and nations on what would that look like uh, within the data centers across Canada. So uh, I'm just, I'm skipping ahead because of all of the time that we <laughs> spent on getting this working together. Um, the other initiative that uh, is currently underway, which is uh, we just got funding for, is a pragmatic trials program um, so how can routinely collected health information be used within the context of, of clinical trials? Uh, this is just getting um, um, stood up at the moment. Uh, Dr. Amy Fryer, who I mentioned just a couple of moments ago, is leading uh, the work around how to bring an equity lens to pragmatic trials using administrative data. Um, and I'm, ex I'm hopeful that we'll be able to share more about that work moving forward. The final piece that I wanted to touch on um, that uh, from HDRN's perspective that I think is relevant, not just to HDRN, but also to uh, administrative data researchers um, writ large is our public advisory council. So um, HDRN has convened a group of folks from across Canada uh, with an interest in uh, administrative data who are coming from the general public. And they exist to provide advice on priorities and projects and really um, um, help us to be thinking about what our, our social responsibility is as administrative data researchers. One of the outcomes or products of that work is a social license for the use of health data. And um, I was really fortunate in the fall to attend their, their meeting. And it was fascinating to hear 
how they view um, the use of routinely collected health information uh, for research purposes. And so what they shared back with us is absolutely it is, it is appropriate and they want us to be using these data for research that will improve clinical care, health services. Um, this really focus on health. I think we could expand it to social services. Um, uh, so long as there is a clearly identified public benefit. Um, what they were not, um, what they did not think was within the social license of the use of these data, um, particularly given the fact that they are not consented data, is to sell the data or to use um, them for a for-profit purpose that does not have a public benefit. So, so really center and core to that social license is the idea of what is the benefit to the public in using information that's been collected about our connect our contacts with the healthcare system. What was there was not a consensus on, the group was really split um, on whether the data could and should be used by private companies. So some folks felt like that was, there, there was public benefit to that. And so they wanted to see that moving forward. There are other folks that said, even if there's public benefit, the use of, of these data by private companies is not within the social license of, of the data center. So a real mixed view there. And then there was also a mixed view on how should researchers and data centers move forward with uh, research using information about systemically marginalized populations. So racialized groups, uh, sexual minorities, um, uh, indigenous populations and Canadian newcomers. Um, There's a lot of uh, variation in what was the be uh, in thoughts on what was the best way to move forward for, for the public good. Um, so just as a wrap up from that, uh, Provincial data are incredibly useful for research purposes. Um, at any moment at MCHP, we have over 300 active research projects. Um, uh, and we're a small group. I know at ICS, there's many, 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 many more. It's a big province. Um, uh, and they're really useful for generating evidence that can be used uh, to inform decision making within the healthcare system. The challenge with provincial data is uh, it, we store them differently, they're recorded differently across the country, and it's really tough to A, make use of the natural experiments that exist across provinces and territories to identify what works, and B, it's really tough as a result to generate a pan-Canadian picture of the health and well-being of Canadians. And so for that, that was a really big reason why the Health Data Research Network of Canada was established to overcome those challenges and to really support re the research community in moving forward with uh, pan-Canadian and eventually multinational uh, research that are using uh, routinely collected health information. And I think there's a couple of minutes for questions. So I, I skipped over a bit. So I hope I didn't skip over important things that raised questions for folks, but there are questions. And I'll, I have the chat open, so, oh, thanks. <laughs> so any questions? Question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Helen Koo, I'm a research facilitator with pediatrics. And I apologize if I missed it, sometimes my mind remembers it's not you. But oh, it probably you. is me. <laughs> it is, yep. Yep, it is up and running. So um, if you go if if you go to our website, and I, I say R because like I, I'm one of the executive people on, on each year. Um, so if you go to our website, like you can get to the dash and you can submit your request there and it'll go through right now. I think there are, oh gosh, I just saw these numbers last week and they've fallen out of my head. Um, I want to say 40 projects that we're processing at the moment. Okay, so researchers can get the data. Nope, the, nope, 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 no, 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 no. Yeah, no, the data, like the researchers don't get the data. What we do is you put the request in saying, I need this information for my research project. Then it gets, to, then Dash distributes it to all of the data networks or data centers in the network. They do the, uh, each of them does a feasibility assessment and then it comes back. Once you get your funding, 
then we facilitate um, federated or distributed analyses where the analyses are conducted in parallel at each of the different data centers and then amalgamated using um, like meta analytic techniques. Yep, yep. <laughs> follow-up question for that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Could you give an example? Are you allowed to give an example of a project where this has been successful? So there's two projects that are nearing completion, um, but I haven't seen a, a project that's actually been completed yet. So I can't give an example of that uh, um, offhand. I think the most similar analogy would be publications coming out of C nodes. Because we're like a lot of the folks on C nodes are also involved with HDRN Canada. So there um that I what we've seen within the C nodes context is really would be analogous to to what we're doing just a broader scope than prescription drugs. Yeah, I have another follow whole bunch of questions that I know we're going to pause. But so in follow up to that, you had a whole bunch of partners I just didn't capture. Are all provinces part of that? Like, there yeah, so so all the provinces are part of it now. Um we're st uh, I shouldn't say we. Um uh, Yukon is standing up a data center right now. Um I think Northwest Territories either did or is about to, but they attended the meeting la uh, last month in Winnipeg. Nunavut does not have a data center yet, but uh, we've been, or um, Kim has been working with them around that. Uh, but the provinces, I think PEI recently did or or is stood one up. Um, uh, Nova Scotia is part of us. Yeah, so all of the, and I think Quebec has someone on the work group leads, but not on the executive. Yeah. And just one other follow-up to that, like, the social data, that's what I'm actually so curious about. And would they all, like, what would have social data? Yeah, so so not many places have social data. So uh, yeah. we have social data. Um, ICS has... Um, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a, yeah, a little bit. I think Pop Data BC has some now as well. But, like, if you're interested in the social determinants, it really becomes uh, what's... What are the data sets that are common across mm -hmm. Canada? And I will say, like we that the common data model I mentioned, we have not gone down the social data road yet. Yeah, we're still needing to do a lot of work within that space. Yeah. No, there aren't yet. <laughs> So amazing, loss, but it's it's all very cool. Thank mm -hmm. thank you for coming. We're really happy to come today. Um, very specific questions about the HDRN. Like, what are the major data sets that are fairly consistent across the provinces that would be quote unquote easy or or more accessible to give you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the hospital data are very common across. Medical claims are fairly uh common across. Um, so really within the health sector. After that, I think it would be prescription drugs. Um, and then after that, it becomes a hodgepodge. Uh, like emergency department data is not as like common in Manitoba, um, but it might be in other places. So like the the core med claims, hospital and prescription drugs are are the most common across. No, that, that's really helpful. I, I was I was interested in the, um, wow. the clinical trial uh, topic yeah. because um, as part of the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, our Committee on Economic Analysis is um, we're, we're actively doing projects linking trial data. Oh, with, okay. With yeah. Economic analyses because the admin data actually is performing better. Oh, so, interesting. So we haven't done a, a national pro we've done it within ICS, yeah. but the next site is to do it nationally and. And having hospital data and the, the claims data would be the main ones that would be interesting. I can connect you with the lead of of the of the trials uh project because that that might be if it's of interest yeah, that could yeah, be helpful. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joan asks, what's the estimated cost of doing a project with the federated data? That is a great question, Joan. Um, so the co <laughs> the cost 
is dependent on the centers you're at you're accessing so we're like the cost like hrn doesn't set the cost the cost is set by the centers doing the work um so like mchp ha we have our analytic cost i believe um ics has their own hourly rate um so it's it will vary based on which center you're accessing and i see you took yourself off um uh muted camera oh let's see. and i'm just i'm just looking at the time here i don't know if there's any other oh, okay. yeah it's so expensive yeah it's like the i i i will say i the cost i mean the costs are fairly comparable across the different data centers and it 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 comes down part of what it comes down to is the analysts like the analyst salaries and benefits is is what we're what we're paying for um at on an hourly rate so well Nick, i'm just looking at the time it's, it's one on the nose I'm yeah <laughs> my my next meeting just popped up <laughs> yeah thank you that really was we're so grateful you came oh in. i hope it was okay <laughs> I, like i think the juices are flowing from a lot of us in terms of all the connections especially so, those of us yeah. connected with ics yeah, no, and the wonderful the difference well it's exciting well, because we have this now video clip first so <laughs> 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 share what's wrong <laughs> but i feel like there's so many people who benefit from seeing the slides and really yeah. connecting with you again after so thank you so oh, much oh my pleasure my pleasure thanks for having me Excellent. Thanks, everyone.